Hey guys, Mr. Happy here, and today I want to talk about the Monk job. I've spoken about the job in a few prior videos, but I decided to do an in-depth guide to the job. This guide will cover single target rotations, AOE rotations, how to use your cooldowns, cross-class abilities, and stats, so I hope you're ready for all this information. If you haven't already, please watch my Dragoon vs. Monk video for a quick overview on all of the Monk abilities at the link in the bottom right. It would be much easier going into this video if you had an understanding of the abilities already. Just one thing I have to say before I talk about this guide. We're going to be assuming you have Fist of Fire up the entire time. It gives you 5% more damage. That's all you really need to know about it. So first, let's start with the most exciting part about the Monk job. Their rotations. Now, Monk is a much more difficult job than most of the other jobs in the game. At least to execute properly. This is primarily due to their position being so important to deal maximum damage. Not to mention that your, rota your rotation tr changes drastically. Ugh. Should anything happen to your Grease Lightning Stacks? But let's get right into it. Whew, hope I'm ready for this one. You'll have two options when it comes to starting a fight. Regardless of whichever you choose, be sure to use cooldowns and apply Touch of Death at the start. After doing that, you can either A, pop Perfect Balance and do the following combo. Snap Punch, Snap Punch, Demolish, Twin Snakes, Snap Punch to get all of your Grease Lightning stacks up, to get your Twin Snakes buff up, and to apply Demolish all at the same time. Or, B, you can go into your standard combo, which we'll talk about in a second, and save Perfect Balance for in case you mess up on your Grease Lightning stacks and they fall off. Now, the combo for option B will be your standard combo even if you open with combo A. So be sure to memorize both combos very well. Now, combo B is actually a very long string of abilities that you can do to maximize your DPS. However, it is important to, important to note that certain parts of this combo will not be possible without the right stats, plus three stacks of Grease Lightning. I'll make note of these changes uh, that you can make at lower skill speed tiers during my exclamation. You know, in fact, <clears throat> I'll just say these things now. The most important thing is that if you do not possess 491 skill speed and you do not have three stacks of Grease Lightning, never use True Strike. Every combo that I'm going to mention, instead of using True Strike, use Twin Snakes instead of it. This is because without 491 skill speed and three stacks of Grease Lightning, if you use True Strike instead of Twin Snakes at any point, your Twin Snakes buff will wear off before you can get back around to it, thus costing you the plus 10% damage buff on a lot of your abilities. It adds up over the course of an entire fight, trust me. Another important note is that the Scholar skill speed buff can severely throw off your timing on all of your rotations. Generally, you'll want to follow these rules in case this buff is applied to you. If Demolish still hasn't fallen off when you get to it again in the rotation, just use Snap Punch and reapply it the next time around. You may also be able to squeeze in a true strike if the scholar ability brings your global cooldown to under two seconds and as you'll hear in the rest of my explanation you meet certain requirements and finally be prepared to overwrite dragon kick preemptively since you may hit a time where dragon kick has a few seconds left on its effect but it won't be up for a few gcds which means it may have two seconds left and you're at your boot shine phase do Dragon Kick instead just to reapply the debuff since by the time you get through your next few abilities, it won't be up and you'll lose a lot of damage from that. Whew. Finally, this rotation assumes that you are doing these abilities on the side that benefits your damage the most, whether it be the flank or the rear. I know that sometimes due to boss mechanics, this can be extremely difficult though, so just do your best. Don't expect to be perfect. So combo B, here we go. Start the fight with Touch of Death only if you didn't do combo A. If you're just starting the fight normally, start with Touch of Death as well as Blood for Blood and uh, Internal Release, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then immediately move into Dragon Kick, then True Strike, then Demolish, followed up by Dragon Kick, Twin Snakes, Snap Punch. The reason for this opening is pretty simple. Dragon Kick naturally does 20 more potency than Boot Shine. So considering at the start of the fight, at this point, you won't be in Opo Opo stance for this move. Your best bet is to just do Dragon Kick first instead of Boot Shine to make use of the extra 20 potency. You use it at the start of the next rotation as well in order to apply the minus 10% blunt resistance on the opponent. You use Demolish this early despite not having any Grease Lightning stacks uh, just so the damage can tick up while you build the Grease Lightning stacks and then you can reapply it when you have three. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, as for True Strike, follow the rules we spoke about before this rotation. I know I said use True Strike there, but fact is, if 
it's twin snakes, then it's twin snakes. Just use it instead if you don't meet the requirements. Now, you'll want to do boot shine into true strike into snap punch and then dragon kick into twin snakes into demolish. Again, good reasons for all of this. Use boot shine now that the opal bonus and dragon kick's debuff are already applied. So the 100% crit chance from doing boot shine from behind makes it deal a lot more damage. This, you snap punch again while waiting for Demolish's buff timer to tick off so that you, can, you don't clip your dots too early. Then, use Demolish the next time around again. Again, Twin Stakes, True Strike, depending on your current stats. You'll repeat the process of alternating Boot Shine, Dragon Kick, and True, Snakes, True Strike's Twin Snakes. That's a difficult one to say. Every single rotation. While using Demolish every third rotation. This ensures that Demolish gets its full duration worth out of its dot that Dragon Kick gets the full duration out of its debuff, and that Twin Snakes gets the most out of its buff timers. So it's very difficult to weave in and out, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, while all that's fine and dandy, it's also very complicated. To further complicate things, you do need to reapply Touch of Death at the appropriate times. You can't just ignore that ability once the fight starts. Basically, whenever it falls off. This doesn't throw off your combos too much, but you must keep one thing in mind. If you use Touch of Death, your next combo will require you to use Twin Snakes regardless of your skill speed. This is because this rotation is calculated to be done with exact global cooldown use. So by throwing in an extra global cooldown, you throw off the timing, requiring you to fit in Twin Snakes the next time you go into Raptor form. Also, while these are your single target rotations, you do have AoE rotations. I mean, I know it's kind of self-explanatory, but we'll talk about them right now. Thankfully. It's a whole lot simpler than your single target rotations, but there are a few rules you still want to follow, and it also costs a lot more TP. Now, if there are under 4 mobs, your AoE rotation only really has one AoE ability in it. So you'll want to do Dragon Kick into Twin Snakes into Rock Breaker. If there are 4 or more mobs, it's Arm of the Destroyer, Twin Snakes, then Rock Breaker. Now keep in mind, this combo will simply empty your TP pool with Arm of the Destroyer, so I recommend using Arm of the Destroyer sparingly since it doesn't do nearly as much damage as Rock Breaker despite being AoE. Now even if there are over 4 enemies, I don't recommend using it every time you make it to Opal Opal Stance, just because it will melt your TP even through Invigorate. And the reason why you use Dragon Kick instead of Boot Shine, despite the fact that you will be in Opal Opal Stance, is simply because you can tab target and apply Dragon Kick to multiple enemies while you're going through your combo, thus increasing the amount of AoE damage that you actually deal. Trust me, it'll work out really well for you in the end. If you feel like using Boot Shine instead though, feel free, but that is why we use Dragon Kick instead of Boot Shine in this rotation. Now, those are both of your rotations. Now obviously, there are some minor things you have to add in. One is the use of Howling Fist, which can be used as to burst important targets down once a minute. Since it doesn't sit on the global cooldown, you can use it wherever you want. As, as long as the situation is right, you can use it wherever and whenever you want. And it can be used in both single target and AoE situations depending on the fight. Since it does do line AoE damage and uh, on single targets it doesn't really matter that it does line AoE damage. It's just good for both situations. Now play this one by ear and use your best judgment however. Shoulder tackle should be used whenever you need to close the gap between you and an enemy. Every second you're not hitting an enemy is the second you risk losing your greased lightning stacks or missing a clipped dot or anything along those lines. Now. As long, you have to remember one thing though, stunning the enemy can sometimes be a bad thing. The Ifrit fight comes to mind. If there's a fight where stunning the enemy will actually hinder your group, then I don't recommend using shoulder tackle. Just run up to the enemy as quick as possible. Steel Peak is very similar. Again, just like shoulder tackle, it doesn't sit on the global cooldown, but it does stun. If an enemy is immune to stuns and you won't need a stun for the, a specific part of the encounter, I recommend using this every time it's available since it does a whopping 150 potency. Also, you can save this for doing burst damage onto, onto high priority targets, another really good use for Steel Peak. Finally, you have Haymaker. Should you ever find yourself in a situation where you are tanking mobs, using Haymaker is one of your best abilities. It, it does a big 170 potency damage hit, which from the front of an enemy is the most you will deal. However, you still need to keep in mind that you do need to keep up Twin Snakes and uh, Greased Lightning while you're using your Haymaker. So, the last ability that I haven't even mentioned yet, as for One Elm Punch, toss that ability aside until PvP. That's when you'll start using it again. So, before talking about personal buffs, 
I think it's important to mention the cross-class abilities you'll want most. Now, your two subclasses, as mentioned in the Dragoon vs. Monk video, are Marauder and Lancer. So you'll want these three abilities, and I mentioned them during the, uh, the video. Blood for Blood, Invigorate, and Mercy Stroke. I'd consider those three abilities mandatory, since they enhance your Monk experience a whole lot. Meaning you should get your Lancer to 34 and your Marauder to 26. All of the other abilities are situational, other than Skull Sunder, which is completely useless. So, Foresight can be used on fights where small adds may be hitting you to improve your survivability, or if the raid is taking a large amount of AoE physical damage. Uh, Bloodbath can simply be used to regenerate some health back to relieve stress on the healers. Faint is rarely useful as a slow on the target, but it can be useful in some fights just for short 10 second periods. Keen Foyer can also be used defensively, but again, not to as great effect as uh, Foresight. And Impulse Drive is actually a really good ability for bursting down low to mid HP targets since it does a consistent 180 potency. Just be careful about spamming it since you do need to keep up Twin Snakes and Grease Lightning. It's the same rules that applied for Haymaker. Same goes for Fracture. If you can afford the TP on a medium length fight, you can squeeze it in similar to how you squeeze in Touch of Death, but overusing it will drain your TP even with Invigorate. So if you plan on using Fracture, use it very, very sparingly. So along with Blood for Blood, you also have internal release as your personal cooldowns. These are your offensive cooldowns. And these are the two cooldowns you will be using on specific phases to increase your damage. Some fights may call for you to save them to help burst down a target, but otherwise they should be applied at the very start of a fight before even using Touch of Death and every time they are available. And don't forget, this is another one, use Invigorate every time you fall be below 500 TP or in an AoE phase of the boss where you need to AoE down adds. I'd personally recommend using it midway into an AoE phase since you want to get this cooldown ticking ASAP so you can get it up again when you become TP starved later in the fight. And finally, two more defensive cooldowns you have. You have Mantra and Second Wind to help support your groups. Use Mantra during phases when the raid is taking a lot of AoE damage and use Second Wind to save your ass when you need a big heal. Now, I want to go back to Mercy Stork really quickly because I feel like I skipped over that by accident. So uh, be sure to use this whenever a high priority target falls below 20% HP for a nice burst of damage. It's like 200 potency or something. That's a lot. The only downside is that it sits on a pretty long cooldown. I mean, it's not on the global cooldown and it doesn't interrupt your combos, but it does have a 90 second cooldown. So just remember that you're only gonna have it once in a while. So you may wanna save it for bursting down high priority targets, not bosses unless there's nothing else to use it on, but other targets such as Titan's Jails or Chirata and Soprana or Nails in the Ifrit phase, things like that. Whew, that was a lot to take in. But we still have one more thing to talk about, stat priorities. Now, there has been some talk about what are the optimal stat priorities for Monk, but I think that the Monks of the community have really come up with a pretty good priority. Strength is automatically a top priority, followed by accuracy until about 480 accuracy, then followed by skill speed until, about, until 491, followed by critical hit rate, followed by determination. Now, the reason for this is simple. Strength is overall damage. It can't be beaten. You absolutely have to make strength a priority. Now, without 480 accuracy, you will miss the boss in turn 5. Now, however, before that, you'll want it to hover in the 470 to 475 area for coil turns 1 through 4. So if you're not planning on doing coil 5 anytime soon, having around 470 accuracy is okay. If you ever need to do coil 5 and you can't get any more accuracy, feel free to use something like Epkalu Omelets as a food since it gives you accuracy and critical hit rate. Uh, now... Skill speed, we've already discussed why you want it at 491. If you don't have enough skill speed, you simply will not be able to use True Strike and Twin Snakes in your combo. That is literally the only reason you want skill speed at such a high number. If it weren't for that, then critical hit rate is more important than both determination and skill speed. So this is a very complicated stat priority right now. Until 491, skill speed is more important, but if you can absolutely not hit 491 in the gear that you have, it's important to get as much critical hit rate as possible. Now, while critical hit rate isn't influential to moves such as uh, Boot Shine, which have a 100% critical hit rate if done in the correct position, it does affect all of your other abilities. So it is a huge DPS increase, and it's a really easy stat to get your hands on. So skill speed, 491, awesome. Critical hit rate, as much as you can get, awesome. Determination, the only reason why it has such a low priority is because 
it's really hard to get a lot of it on your gear and have those other stats that you need like accuracy and skill speed and critical hit rate. So because of the ease of acquiring crit over determination, determination, despite being a really, really strong stat, it's just not present enough on gear for us to really make it a huge priority. Now, some of you, and I'm throwing this in as a bonus because they didn't have this planned. Now, some of you have been asking me about monk macros as well. And simply put, you don't really have many macro options. I mean, the only macro options that readily come to mind are the ability to implement Mercy Strokes, Steel Peak, and Howling Fist into your other abilities so that they will be used on cooldown. And I put these on the screen right here so you can see what the macros would look like. Now for monks, this is okay on some fights, but on a lot of fights, it's generally ineffective since a lot of fights, you'll need to properly time the use of these abilities to burst high priority targets down. Some of you may have heard also of these easy macros for Monk, where you simply add co Earl and Raptor Stance abilities to macros that have Boot Shine and Dragon Kick on them in such an order that they will always do the newest form first. What this macro attempts to do, as you see it on your screen, is it attempts to look down the list. Now, this list is set in a priority, meaning the first move has priority over the other two moves should they all be available at the same time. Now, you'd expect this would make things easy for this, for example, this one. If Snap Punch is available, it will always do Snap Punch over Twin Snakes, and Twin Snakes will always happen over Boot Shine. There's a few reasons why this doesn't work. One, it's inconsistent. Now, I use macros like this on my Bard with Bloodletter and, uh, and Misery's End, and sometimes, even though I have Misery's End as a top priority, it will completely bypass it and use one of the other moves. So, it's inconsistent is a big reason. It can work on occasion, but it's extremely inconsistent. That's all I'm saying. Uh, not only that, but sometimes your combos call for, call for you to make a judgment call on the fly and locking it down so that you can only do certain abilities when you hit these certain macros, it really limits what you're capable of. So my advice, if you're going to use macros, use them sparingly, but for the most part, don't use macros on Monk. That's just my own personal advice. If you can find a good use for them, it's perfectly okay. Maybe you want to shoulder tackle your focus target. That's perfectly okay too. Uh, but very, very small macros like that that just make minor gameplay changes. So, all right. I think I covered everything that needs to be mentioned on Monk. I know it might seem scary to take on such an overwhelmingly intricate job, but once you've practiced around with it a bit, I think you'll find that the job is fun and rewarding. Some people say that Monk DPS sucks right now, but quite frankly, I see quite a few Monks pull huge numbers. It just takes a lot of practice and fine tuning to get them to the point where they feel natural and they feel powerful. They're also, you know, the more gear you have, the better. That always helps. But anyway, guys, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, favorite, subscribe, and share. Also, be sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. If you have any questions about this Monk video or any of my other videos, feel free to ask me on those platforms. Also, I would like to thank the monks of the Final Fantasy XIV community for coming up with a lot of this gr these great theories and uh, crafting on how important stats are, especially the monks of Legacy, my free company, who put together a very intricate post so that everybody else could understand how it works. So thank you guys, you've done a lot. But anyway guys, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, and until next time, take care.